Welcome everyone. I'm Christine Biglin from St. Mary's County Library and tonight we have Barb Whipke with us. She is the owner and operator of Wild Birds Unlimited with two locations, one in Lexington Park and the other one in La Plata, Maryland. Um, and she is our, our bird expert. And tonight she is going to talk to us about Save the Songbirds. Welcome, Barb. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Um, hopefully I've had the chance to meet many of you in the store. I do see a lot of familiar faces out there. And if not, hopefully I will at some point. So tonight we're going to be talking about something a little depressing, but it's not all depressing news. So uh, <laughs> not all bad stuff. So uh, there was a report, a study that was actually done by science. If you want to look this up, uh, if you just Google, um, it was sci science.org is actually the website of the, the place where this was done, but it was uh, basically 2019, what they found was 2.9 billion songbirds have been lost since 1970. So you went into, you know, it gets very technical, the, the whole study in that, but it's out there if you want to take the time and read through the whole study. But basically what they found that songbirds are in trouble. The positive side of that, as we have seen, you know, several years ago, we would not have looked outside and seen bald eagles soaring overhead. Um, I'm sure we all remember a time where you just would not have seen those, but we got involved, we made a difference, and now it's not at all unusual, especially here in Southern Maryland, to look out and see that. Another one back in the early 80s, um, you remember the huge red flag on bluebirds. You would not have seen bluebirds. But again, we got involved, we started putting houses up, and now we're seeing bluebirds in yards. My own the yard is a perfect example. I should not have bluebirds in my yard, and I do. So, you know, it's not all bad news. Um, we do know that by getting involved, we can make a difference. Uh, Waterfowl is another one that by changing habitat, you know, we've made a difference. Some of the birds that we've seen that are in trouble through this study are some very common birds. Our dark-eyed junca is what a lot of people know as snowbirds. They are a big one, down by 168 million birds during those 30 years. The little white-throated sparrows that we see, we love hearing in the winter time, 93 million. So if you think about when you look out in the backyard and you see those blue jays, out of four blue jays, one of those four has disappeared during those 30 years. Those dark-eyed juncos, one out of four has disappeared. The rose-breasted grosbeak that we love seeing come by in the spring and the fall, one out of four of those have disappeared. Baltimore Orioles is another one that we're seeing a lot of those decline. So we have the opportunity to make a difference. So that's what we're going to be talking about tonight is ways that we can make a difference to try to bring those back before it gets too ugly. So along with this study, Cornell Lab, I'm sure everybody's aware of Cornell Lab and the wonderful work they do with the study of ornithology. They have looked at seven simple actions that we can do to make a difference. So along with that, Wild Birds Unlimited has started a Save the Songbirds campaign to coincide with those seven actions. So the first one is make windows safer. Second one is keep cats indoors. And we're gonna dig into all of those a little bit deeper. Number three is using native plants. Number four is avoiding pesticides. Five is drink shade grown coffee. Number six is use less 
plastic. And seven is do citizen science. So now we're gonna take just a little bit deeper dive into each one of those and discuss what that means. So the first one, safe for windows. That is a huge one. One billion birds are estimated to die each year after hitting windows. So if you've ever seen or heard that crash on your window, that thud is unforgettable. So a couple things you can do with your bird feeding poles, and I know this one sounds crazy, is set your poles within three feet of the window. And I know this sounds crazy. Why would I set them so close? If you set that pole within three feet of the window, the bird's not going to have enough speed when it takes off to hit the window at enough force to cause damage. So you either want to hit it, set that pole within three feet or 10 feet away. So it's not as apt to hit it. So closer than three feet or further than 10 feet is where you want that pole set. When birds see your window, the reason they tend to hit that window so often, if you step out in your backyard and take a look at your window when the sun's shining on it, you're going to see the reflection of the trees and the clouds, all that on your window. Birds have a more vivid sense of color than you do. So everything you're seeing, they're seeing much more intensely than you are. Then you add to that the fact that maybe a hawk's coming in or a blue jay who's famous for imitating a hawk. They're there feeding, they get startled. They just take off without paying a whole lot of attention. They see those clouds, they see those trees, they think they're flying in safety. So anything you can do on that window to break up that reflection is going to help them. I'm gonna show you a few ideas. So probably a lot of you have already heard of window alert stickers. These are just bright ultraviolet stickers that you can put on your window. You put them on the outside, you spread them around and that's going to help break up the reflection. If you have large picture windows, we have featherweight. I'm not sure how well those are going to show up, but it's basically just little squares here and they come on a roll that you would roll down onto the window. And they're evenly spaced that way. You're gonna roll it down and they're going to adhere to the window that way. Probably not with white paper. But that is going to help if you have a large window. So that's one option. We just got these new ones in, which we are loving. So these ones, again, I don't know how well they're going to show on camera, but these ones are really cool in that they will peel off and are reusable, iridescent, really cool looking ones. So you can take those off, clean your windows, stick them right back on. So those are reusable in all different shapes. This one here I have, it's honeybees, butterflies. We've got little dots, hummingbirds, frogs, a bunch of different ones on those. So those are a new one we just recently got in. You can take stained glass, anything like that that you can hang on your window that's going to help break up those reflections, going to help. What I have here is a roll of what we call scare tape. You can take and hang that from the outside of your windows. That's going to flutter on the outside. It's just a mylar tape. It's going to help break up that reflection and just alert the birds that, hey, there's a piece of glass here. There's something here. Just catch their attention. 
Even window bird feeders, as crazy as this sounds, a window bird feeder is going to break up that reflection. It's going to slow the birds down. They're coming in to land. It's breaking up the reflection. They're stopping in to get something to eat. So anything like that you can do to break up those reflection is going to help with the craft zone. If you've got young kids, let them paint on the outside of the windows, putting screens on the outside of your window. Anything to break up those reflections is going to help with the window crash. Number two was cats. Obviously, the no-brainer is keep the cats inside. Sometimes that's not always going to be an option. Maybe it's not your cats, it's somebody else's cats. In that case, things you wanna do is make sure you're not setting your feeding pole up next to a bush where those cats can hide under the bush, wait for the birds to come and feed and then pop out and surprise them. So in that case, you want your feeders out in the wide open where the birds can be alerted. We also have something called Birds Be Safe Collars in the store. If you have those cats that absolutely cannot be indoors, it's a roughly little clown collar is what it looks like. It has an iridescent edge on it. Again, those birds have that bright sense of color. So that bright little clown color is going to alert the birds. We used to use the bells that we thought would work. Of course, cats stalk so quietly that that bell does not jingle. So the birds don't hear it. So this bright little collar will help. Catios are the newest rage out there. You haven't heard of those. Basically, it's like a small patio built just for cats and you build it onto the side of your house so your cat can get some outdoor time, but the cat, the birds are safe and the cat is protected. They're inside a safe zone. And of course, if you just have a patio yourself or a screen porch where the cats can go out, they'll get some bird activity, some fresh air, but the birds are kept safe. And one note on that, if I, we hear all the time like, oh, my cat catches the birds, but he doesn't hurt them. I can, I just release the birds. Cat saliva is poisonous to birds. If a cat catches a bird, no matter whether that bird seems like it's okay, you have to get that bird to a rehabber. That saliva is poisonous. So don't release that bird and assume it's okay. You do need to get that bird into a rehabber for treatment. Okay, number three was native plants. Obviously native plants, less grass. Grass doesn't give a whole lot back to the birds. Adding more native plants is going to be very beneficial for the birds, for the butterflies, for the insects. Of course, the whole life cycle thing, if we're increasing the number of insects, we're increasing the food population for the birds. So adding those native plants that's going to just help with the life cycle, more food for the, the birds. Um, for those of you that were able to get some of our spring native plants that we brought in, we do have some fall asters coming in here in the next couple of days. If you're on Facebook, we'll announce there when they come in. I do expect them any day now. Um, they're coming from a local small business owner here. Um, in Calvert. If you're on Facebook, we'll, we'll announce them there, but feel free to pick up the phone and give us a call in either store. We'll have them come in in both stores. 
um, but those should be here in the next couple of days. But decreasing the amount of your lawn, if you can just take an area of your lawn and let it grow naturally, add some native plants. Good excuse not to have to mow the grass as much. Um, and of course, those native plants. Um, one of those, uh, the milkweed that we got this spring. I came home a couple days ago and just as I pulled in, I saw a monarch and I was like, oh, let me, let me see if I can video it. And if you haven't been on our Facebook page the last couple of days, I did put the video there, but I'm standing there videoing this monarch and just by chance, she happened to lay the egg while I was videoing her. So she actually laid the egg and I caught it on video. So I'll, she, it should hatch here in the next couple of days. So I'll try to catch a picture of the larva too. So, but yeah, um, those native plants are going to add seeds, berries, things like that to your yard. And that means it's less bird seed you have to buy too. So it's kind of a win-win. And then along with that is you can avoid pesticides. So less grass means you're not going to, you can let more of those native plants grow. You're not going to need to use the fertilizer, stay away from the Roundup. If you feel like you do need to use some type of pesticides or something, please visit our local nurseries and ask them for some organic options that are bird friendly, bird safe. I can't help you with that because I will tell you, we do not use any pesticides, anything like that in our yard. My husband's a beekeeper. So not only are we trying to protect the birds, but we're also trying to protect the bees as well. So I can't give you any advice on that, but do try to avoid any of those pesticides, insecticides. When you are killing off any of those insects, you're also killing off the bugs that are in turn the food for those birds. So try to reduce all of those as much as you possibly can. And then choose shade grown coffee, coffee plantations. If you have ever looked at how they grow coffee, Basically, it's like our new neighborhoods here where they just clear cut everything and there is no food left. It's the same way with a coffee plantation. They take everything out and that's how they grow their coffee. Shade grown coffees are done much differently. They plant around the trees, the bushes, leave as much as they can. It does cause the the coffee plants to grow much slower. A lot of people find that that makes the coffee more tasty because it does grow slower. But shade grown coffee also allows them to reduce the use of pesticides. A lot of different types of shade grown coffee you can get. The, the brand we happen to carry in here is Birds and Beans, which is certified by the Smithsonian. And we have several different types that we carry here, ground and whole bean. Um, one of the, the birds, um, it protects a lot of different birds, warblers, orioles, painted buntings, things like that. But a lot of different birds that it does help so shade grown coffee, and who doesn't need another excuse to drink coffee, right? And then using less plastic. Uh, it's estimated that 4,900 million metric tons of plastic has accumulated in landfills. And if you were to Google and just look at some of the pictures of like the albatross and some of the seabirds and the plastic that has been found in those birds, it, it's really sad. So trying to avoid plastics, um, there's at least 80 seabird species that have been found to ingest plastic. So we have a couple products we have brought in here to try to help with that. 
One of the brands is Buzzy, which is a reusable plastic wrap, basically uh, made out of a wax type material. And then the warmth of your hand is basically what causes it to hear, adhere and you can reuse it. Comes in sandwich wrap, food wrap. So we've got several different styles of that, but that's one option. You can find these at a lot of different stores and that just to look for reusable plastic style wraps um, instead of a Ziploc baggies and all that. There's a lot of reusable bags in that that you can get now. Of course, using paper over plastic or any kind of containers that you can use, glass versus plastic, that type of thing. Also, um, one of the things we have done is most of our feeders are made out of a recyclable material. So if you were to come in and look, you would find that most of our feeders are done with a recycled. These are made out of recycled milk cartons. So we try to do things like that to try to give back. Right now, our La Plata store is recycling seed bags. We're working with the town of La Plata. You can bring your seed bags in. They are taking them to Delaware to be recycled to make a bike rack for the town of La Plata. So anytime you can recycle is a good thing. So if you do have to use plastics, just look for places to recycle those. Um, and then an excuse to watch birds. So being a citizen scientist, I know a lot of you already do eBird, do our Project Peter Watch with us, our Christmas bird count. Many of you right now have been very involved with the Breeding Bird Survey. A lot of you who are in our Facebook group, um, I know Tyler Bell is constantly asking you, have you reported that nest of bluebirds? <laughs> Where are you located? So yeah, it's constantly um, anything you can do like that, being a citizen scientist, helping to report those numbers is a good thing. So. Quite often when we're doing these talks, we're talking about those type of things. So just keep doing those is a big help. Um, and if you don't know how to use eBird, please let us know, we'd be happy to help you with that. Uh, but it's, you can either do it through your computer. There's an app you can download right onto your cell phone. Just go to eBird.com, just the letter E, bird. Dot com. It's very self-explanatory, but it's also a great way to keep a list of birds that you've seen. But it's also a big help, helps us to watch and see where we might be losing numbers on certain types of birds and things. So those are different ways that you can actually make a difference. Seven simple actions keeping your windows safer at home, keeping those cats indoors, less lawn, planting natives, avoiding pesticides, drinking that shade grown coffee, less plastic, and then reporting the birds, citizen scientists. A great book I wanted to mention, if you're looking for something, I'm sure they have this one at the library, we have it here as well, Nature's Best Hope by Douglas Tallamy is an amazing book. This one will totally change the way you think about your yard and planting natives and that. Um, really good book. Last name is T-A-L-L-A-M-Y and that's Douglas Tallamy. He has several books, uh, but this one is, will definitely open your eyes. So he has a Facebook page as well. You can follow him there, but really good stuff in that. And then with that, what questions do you have for me? Okay, well, nothing came in during your talk, Barb, but um, if anybody has questions, they can feel free to, to type them in now. Um, 
I just wanted to mention that um, you talked about the first thing was protecting your windows, you know, by putting right. stickers on them or whatever. Um, the The library in Leonardtown has a makerspace, and the other two branches also have um, Cricut cutting machines, um, and you can cut your own vinyl. Uh, oh, on, on those machines. So um, we have open hours in Leonardtown. If anybody wants to come in and, and use our Cricut machine, you can cut on uh, reusable or repositionable vinyl. So you can make whatever oh, shape awesome. you want and stick them on your windows. Very good. Yeah. So I just had to put in a little plug for uh, a service awesome. that you can get at your library. Yay. Yeah. Um, have they redone that study to see if the numbers are picking back up? They have not. That one was just done in 2019. Oh, so it's, it's fairly new, yeah. Okay. Um, but I guess the citizen scientists outlets that you talked about, do they, do they keep any sort of running total to <laughs> see? Like, I, I don't know if that's possible for them exactly, but. Yeah, they they use those and a lot of different groups and that use those, but I'm not exactly sure how. Okay. Um, have you seen any changes locally for bird populations? Like, is it noticeable to you? I would say, you know, it changes year to year. So I, Interesting enough that I will say that bluebird numbers I have definitely seen come up. Um, we had, if you all remember the year we had the late, it was a late March snow that we had. There, it must have been probably five, maybe even six years ago, there were a lot of bluebirds lost. Bluebirds are our first nesters of the year. And so they, they break away and separate, pair off in February. So when we got that March snow, they had already paired off. During the winter months, they live communally in a box, six, seven, eight, 10, 12 in a box for body warmth. So when we got that March snow of several days, there were only, they were living in pairs in boxes. So there was not enough in there for body heat. And a lot of people went out and found dead bluebirds in their boxes. Mm -hmm. So with bluebirds, it takes about three years for them to repopulate. So that next year, the next couple of years, we definitely noticed the numbers down. <laughs> but we have noticed them come back up the last few years. This year, we're having a really good bluebird year. Several of our customers, their bluebirds have even nested a fourth time this year. Oh my. So it's going to be really interesting to see what the winter looks like. Um, I feel like sometimes birds are kind of aware of what things are going to be like and they're preparing in advance. Oh. oh. So it will be interesting to see whether we have a tough winter and they're preparing for it ahead of time. Oh. Bringing in the reinforcements. <laughs> right. <laughs> Beep up their numbers. Um, okay. You when you were talking about cats, um, you said if your cat gets a bird, the bird needs to be taken to a rehabber. So Absolutely. there was a question by Crystal. Are there any local rehabbers in this? Yeah, in the Chip, can you grab me that blue book there? Yeah, so there is um, she's probably going to hate me for this. Um, Pat Tarrant over in Calvert does songbirds. And her number is 410-610-6903. And then I also recommend actually using, if you're in St. Mary's County, using animal control 
because sometimes they have access to wildlife rehabilitators that we don't. So animal control for St. Mary's is 301-475-8200. Okay, thank you. Um, and I see Marla's asking a question about seed. Mm -hmm. um, she said she feeds the Nomad seed blends almost exclusive, exclusively, but do I need to be offering more whole sunflower seeds in the shell for the birds as we go into the fall for those birds who will start making the seed caches? So as we go into the fall, what she's talking about, the birds will be caching seed away, storing them up for winter. So my go-to in the winter time, as we get into the later fall, I'll also start offering some tree nutty plus seed, which has a little bit of seed in the shell, some of the striped and the black oil, which will let them store it away. So it still gives them some of the no mess in there. I feed no mess year round, but I also start offering some tree nutty plus. So what they'll do is they'll use that and poke into the bark of the tree, into little spots and fences, places where they can store it up to come back and get it in the winter time. So we will see them here in the next three, four weeks you'll notice your birds and you'll see it when it happens at your feeders. So right now they're hanging out at your feeders and they're going to eat. And all of a sudden you're gonna start noticing it. Usually people notice it first with chickadees and titmice. All of a sudden they're coming to your feeders and they're going and they're going the same place, back and forth, back and forth. And just like they're busy at something. And that's your sign that they have started to cash seed away. And that's exactly what they're doing is storing it away. When do they usually start doing that? Typically it is mid-September, mid, mid to late September. Okay. This year's been kind of weird. So I kind of hesitate to even say. <laughs> Typically feeder activity would have slowed down by now, but it has not this year. That's for sure. <laughs> I was telling yeah, Barb beforehand, weird, right? I was in her store today restocking because I'm getting cleaned out like every three days. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. And then somebody has asked about the, the bird flu. And actually, that was not a recommendation to take the feeders down uh, for the spring. So that was not a, a concern that we had around here. What that was, was more waterfowl. If you had water, what that was, was people with waterfowl. He's asking, um, is recommended this spring, we removed our bird feeder because of the bird flu. When will it be safe to put the feeder back in service this season? So um, what he's speaking of was there was an issue with waterfowl having a bird disease. So it was not a problem with feeder birds. However, if you had poultry in your own yard, then it was thought that you may not want to be feeding the birds if you were concerned about it. So say you live on the water where there was a concern with having waterfowl around there and you wanted to reduce the risk of bringing waterfowl in around your own backyard chicken flock. But if you were just had feeder birds, it was not a concern for this, this uh, waterfowl disease. So yes, it's perfectly fine to go ahead and have your bird feeders out. That's good news. Um, Oh, you know, what counts as a songbird? Like you, like this was Save the Songbirds, but I was wondering, yeah. is that a- So that is basically category? gonna be any of your feeder birds. 
So when we talk oh. about your waterfowl, that's going to be your ducks, uh, the birds you're seeing when you go to the water. But your songbird's going to be any of your birds that are coming to your bird feeders. And actually some that aren't even at your feeders, but any of the bright, <laughs> small, colorful birds. And, and they're different enough from each other that, you know, like they don't, wouldn't get the same diseases? Or is, oh, uh, no, you were saying that it could be passed on from what, I, I was just saying like it was primarily the waterfowl that had the bird flu. Right, it was a more of a problem with waterfowl and poultry. Do you know why it was more their, their problem than other birds? I don't really. Oh, yeah. okay, all right. And I will mention right now, um, we are getting a lot of calls. People are seeing bald cardinals and bald blue jays. That's perfectly fine. Um, birds are molting after birds finish with nesting. Then they go through a molt. They need to change out those feathers and get on fresh feathers to make it through the winter months. So they are just molting. It seems like blue jays and cardinals are the most hideous looking ones when they molt. Um, most of them seem to do it a few feathers at a time, but blue jays and cardinals seem to strip the whole head. So don't worry about that when you see those. The things you can do to help them though is to offer those high protein foods. So suets, uh, peanuts, um, if you do shop in the store, the bark butter bits, the nesting blend, you'll notice we keep the nesting blend out because it is very high in protein. Bird's feathers are made up of over 90% protein. So that's why we ask that you feed a lot of high protein foods this time of year. So keep feeding the nesting blend, feeding those peanuts, the bark butter, bark butter bits, anything with a lot of protein in it is what you can feed to help get them through this molting time. During that time, their, their immune systems kind of compromise. So we wanna help give them a little boost. Are there any different varieties of birds that might be showing up this time of year that we haven't Yeah, seen? so we are just, oh. great question. We are just starting into the migration season. So that's another reason to get those feeders clean and get them out there with a variety of foods in there because we're just starting the migration season. So we should start to see some different birds moving through. We're early in the migration but we will start to see some of the different migrating birds coming through as they start to head south. So, and that will be basically any of them that we have seen in the spring, we'll now start to see them heading back the other direction. Oh, good. So I did see today a couple reports of red-breasted nuthatches in Maryland. So, they don't always spend their winters here in Maryland. So I would like to hope that this is a year that we get them. I haven't seen the Finch report yet, but hopefully this will be a year where we get them because they are cool little friendly birds that are always fun to have at our feeders. <laughs> when does that Finch report come out? I don't, I don't even know exactly when it comes out. But oh. it's, it's always a big hub hub. Google and see if you can find anything when it comes out. So, um, but it's always exciting when it, you, you always hear birders, the finch reports out, the finch reports <laughs> out. So, um, because it basically what this report does, it's a study that is done to let us know if they're, what the food crop looks like in the north. So basically, if there's a shortage of food in the northeast, then those birds have to move a little further south for the winter, late September, October. Oh, okay. So we always hope there's a shortage of food in the northeast. So some of those cool birds like the pine siskins and the red-breasted nuthatches so they have to come spend their winter with us. Of course, that's probably not the kindest thing for us to hope for the bird, <laughs> but selfishly. Just the silver lining, you know? If, I if know, right? Are getting somewhere, it's okay for somebody. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> okay, well, we'll we'll look forward to that. Um, yes. Okay, well, that might be around the time of our next program because um, the next time you'll be joining us is September twenty second. We'll be talking about okay. the bird bird feeding basics for the top ten birds of Southern Maryland. Um, Perfect. Okay, you want to just give a quick preview of of what you'll be talking about? Yeah. So that one, we're basically going to be talking about the top 10 birds of Southern Maryland, and it will be the top 10 birds that are here during the, the fall and winter months with us. And then we'll go over the foods that those particular birds like. So if you're trying to entice those birds in, we'll discuss what type of foods those birds like and why they choose those particular birds as well as what type of feeders they like. Not only do birds have a favorite yard, but they have a favorite food and they have a favorite feeder in that yard. So when you're trying to, customers will come in and say, I love cardinals, but they never come to my feeders. And then when they'll show us pictures of their feeder, none of the feeders in their yard is designed for a cardinal to eat from. So we'll, cover all of those little tips to get those top 10 birds into your yard. Okay, well, that sounds great. Um, well, I think we've covered all our questions, so maybe we'll just close a little earlier than usual today because um, we've covered our topic. And um, so I just wanna thank everybody for joining us and especially you, Barb, it's always nice to, um, to get some more of your knowledge.